How's everybody doing? Hello, Joe. Always terrific to see you. I see a lot of uh, familiar and wonderful faces in the room. Um, uh, do I have slides? I think I sent slides. Uh, I hope I have slides. I can just ad lib if not. Um, they'll be up in a second. Okay. Well, it's absolutely wonderful to see you all today. And uh, what I'd love to do is to talk with all of you about a conversation and a topic that I know that we're all very passionate about, which is how do we unleash the power of data, IT, and innovation to improve health? I would submit to you, if I can get this thing to click, yes, that there's never been a better time than right now to be an innovator at the intersection of healthcare, data, and IT. I know that in all of our day-to-day -day lives, there's a lot of stresses, a lot of pressures, a lot of obstacles around which we have to negotiate, a lot of barriers to which to power through. I know there are days where we go home feeling like every bone in our body has been snapped in two. But I would submit to you that that's because we're all going through a process of affecting one of the most fundamental changes in the history of healthcare, and that there's never been a better moment than right now to affect this change. And I would submit to you that the reasons why this is such an incredible time to be an innovator at this intersection of data, IT, and healthcare is because two mega trends that I've been waiting for since I was a small child are finally locking in. One, new incentives that actually reward the improvement of quality, health, and value. And secondly, information liberation. I'd like to talk a bit more about both these mega trends today because they're really locking in now. And at the intersection of new incentives and information liberation is rocket fuel for all of us to generate innovation and progress, help improve health, help save lives, and help create a stronger America. So let's talk about uh, incentives uh, as a mega trend to start. Now, I don't have to actually take you through this diagram because I'm sure you've seen this a zillion times and are, are very familiar with it, but part one of the new incentives is meaningful use. And meaningful use is a great first step in beginning to align incentives to use health IT and use data to improve health, improve quality, improve outcomes across the board. Um, I don't need to talk more about this because you know <laughs> a whole heck of a lot about it, but I would also say that it's only part one because part two, which is very important to understand, and which is a real game changer from our standpoint, is payment reform in the Affordable Care Act. True transformation of the healthcare system, I think we all know this, depends on changing how we pay for care. It's not a complete driver of change, but it's a very, very important prerequisite to change. Famously, our healthcare system has historically paid by the piece. It's paid fee for service. It's paid per doctor visit, paid per surgery, paid per hospital stay. And our system has successfully delivered rapidly escalating volumes of visits, surgeries, and hospital stays, and hasn't actually adequately funded, adequately rewarded the kinds of activities that keep people out of the hospital, out of the ER, keep them healthy as possible, uh, and improve quality, improve efficiency, and improve health. The Affordable Care Act has a whole series of provisions that move Medicare and Medicaid strongly in the direction of rewarding value, rewarding health, rewarding quality, as opposed to pure volume. And in addition to the programs that you've heard about, like the Shared Savings Accountable Care Organization Program, or bundled case rates, or hospital acquired condition incentive programs, et cetera, I think the real game changer is the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. Have you all heard about the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation? Who actually has heard about it? Fantastic. <laughs> because early on when we were talking about this, nobody raised their hand. We said, oh my gosh. Because this is actually really a, a fundamental change in how Medicare operates. Because it's through this center been given the funding and the authority to manage itself scientifically and rationally. To seek to identify, validate, and scale new ways of paying for care that reward quality and reward health and drive better outcomes for the Medicare and Medicaid population. So this is led by a very talented guy, Rick Gilfillan, and, and a tremendous team that's come on board, very enthusiastic, and driving very aggressively to move Medicare and Medicaid into the future when it comes to rewarding value, rewarding quality, rewarding health, uh, and actually in turn helping to catalyze the same kinds of payment reforms in the private sector. Uh, among insurers who've actually wanted to do this for a very long time but haven't been able to because Medicare and Medicaid have anchored the system in fee-for-service payment. Very difficult to move the entire system toward value-based payment if the biggest payers are actually paying fee-for-service. But now that Medicare and Medicaid are moving in that direction, private payers can move in that direction as well, and I think over the next several years we'll definitely see a big movement toward rewarding quality, rewarding health, rewarding uh, activities that produce better quality, better health, and better outcomes. This is incredibly important for health information exchange. Why? Because at the end of the day, 
Health information exchange that improves quality, improves care coordination, improves health, has to be supported by a business case. Otherwise, it's not sustainable, as we've actually all been talking about. And payment reform, on top of meaningful use, actually creates a long-term business case to share information to help people stay healthy and help improve quality. If you look at the new kinds of uh, accountable delivery systems that are emerging, uh, medical homes, ACOs of all kinds of different flavors, bundled case rate teams, programs to help uh, reduce readmission, so on and so forth, you know, these are new kinds of delivery system constructs that require a whole new set of muscles to work. Right? They require the ability to have cl timely clinical data, just-in-time decision support. They require the ability to integrate and coordinate care across a whole host of different providers. The ability to extend the, 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 the reach of the physician and the care provider outside the walls of the office and the hospital. The ability to engage consumers in their own care and help them take better care of themselves. The ability to actually mine data, figure out the stitch in time that will save the hospitalization. These are all muscles that providers haven't had before, and it's a huge opportunity for the IT innovators and innovators of the world to supply these muscles to providers to enable them to prosper and deliver the best possible care under the new reimbursement system. So at the end of the day, care delivery innovation fundamentally requires data and IT innovation in order to work. It's not going to work without it. But the good news is I think as a country, we've been preparing a long time for this moment, and I'm very confident that we'll rise to the challenge and provide the kind of musculature to providers that enable them to, to succeed. So that's actually part one, uh, trend number one of why I'm so optimistic at this point uh, about the ability for data and IT to help improve health and healthcare. The second mega trend beyond incentive change is information liberation. And y'all are about information liberation in a major, major way. You were actually doing it long before it was cool to do so, and this is now your moment to make it happen. So at HHS, we're doing our best to help catalyze and support this every way we possibly can, and we are promoting a portfolio approach to this. You may have heard Farzad Mostashari talk about this recently, but as opposed to there being only one way to do this, we think that there are multiple ways to make patient data more liquid to support greater health, greater quality, greater value. There are data sharing networks uh, among trusted, uh, trusted groups. There's the ability to actually, through the direct project, move data from point A to point B in a proactive way. There's the ability to put data in the hands of consumers so they can actually transport the data wherever they need for it to go. And we don't think that any one of these is actually the way to go. We think that all of them, as a portfolio, have something important to contribute to making patient data more liquid and fundamentally achieving the goal of helping a patient's data go wherever it needs for it to go in order for that patient to be as healthy as possible. So a couple of projects that we've engaged in recently uh, that I'm sure you all have heard of. Direct project we just talked about. We're very, very excited about this. The thing that we're actually most excited about is actually how it happened. So does everyone here know the story of how the direct project happened? Raise your hand if you do. Well, what actually happened was there was a, uh, a hearing uh, that a committee held about information exchange. And a doctor came to this hearing and said, look, I understand that you're all working on super sophisticated stuff, but I've got this very basic problem. I have an EHR. I have another doctor who has an EHR to whom I have to refer a patient. We both have the same EHR from the same company. How do I get my patient's record from me to this other doc. And he said actually that he thought that the way to do it, the only way he could think of to do it, was to print out the record and fax it to the other doc so they could enter it into their EHR. And he had said that unfortunately, before he had really thought about it, he had emailed the record to the other doc, at which point the committee had a heart attack because he'd broken four laws in the process. And he said, I know that was really bad, but can you help me with this very basic problem? I have to get information from point A to point B. And we said, well, actually, yes, we, we can help you, but as opposed to convening a bunch of eggheads in a room and not talking to anybody and coming out with an answer you know, two years later, right? we instead said, look, we're not exactly sure how to solve this problem, but we're actually pretty confident that America knows how to solve this problem. So we brought on board a very talented innovator named Arian Malk and said, your job is to convene a group of volunteers in an open wiki space and open public forums to try to solve this problem. Anyone and everyone in America who wants to help solve this problem of how we help this doctor get information from point A to point B securely, without breaking the law easily, you're welcome to join. Over 65 organizations joined, big, small, young, old. Within 90 days, they came up with a spec for secure healthcare email. 90 days after that, they had actually working code. 90 days after that, they had it in production. And now, uh, something like, uh, I think, 70 organizations representing over 95% of the EHR install base of America have said we are going to direct enable our products over the next 12 months, which is amazing. 
And, and we're thrilled that we actually were, frankly, a very small part of that story. <laughs> All we did was articulate an objective on behalf of a doctor who had said, I've got this very basic problem that would generate huge value if it were solved for my patients. We convene a neutral convening ground where people get together and solve it, and then America solved the problem. It's a wonderful example of crowdsourcing, government 2.0, name the buzzword you want, but what happened is, in a very short period of time, real progress was made. Um, a second project we're excited about is called Blue Button. Have you heard of Blue Button? Who here has actually not heard of Blue Button? Okay, well, for those of you who haven't heard about, this is actually a very, even simpler project in a lot of ways. So it turns out that three of the largest repositories of personal health information in the world are Medicare, which pays claims for 47 million people, uh, the VA and the DOD, uh, because the VA and the DOD deliver care directly to lots and lots and lots of soldiers and veterans. So what happened is, is in October of last year, we decided to give, through a capability called Blue Button, decided to give Medicare beneficiaries, veterans, and uh, TRICARE beneficiaries the ability to download an electronic copy of their own data. We already had these portals, my Medicare.gov or my Health Event, where you could go authenticate yourself, get an account, and see your own claims or see your own PH, uh, uh, personal health record information. Uh, we just added literally a blue button that enables you to hit it and download a copy, human readable, machine parsable as well, of your own data. Now, this we thought was actually such a minor deal in the scheme of things, we didn't even really make a big announcement. So we said, look, of course we should give people the ability to download their own data. But it turns out to have become a very, very, very big deal because this isn't necessarily ubiquitously possible across the private sector. In fact, we actually had multiple private sector folks come to us and say, after we launched Blue Button, are you allowed to do that? Isn't it a HIPAA violation if you actually give people the ability to download their own data? <laughs> we said, no, <laughs> no, we want you to do this. It's actually a really good thing to do this, but actually illustrates the level of confusion out there around a lot of these issues. And so um, I think that actually even more potentially impactful than giving 55 million Americans the ability to download a copy of their own data directly is the precedent it sets. And the clarity of example it says uh, it sets that, you know, actually it is a good idea, and in fact legal, <laughs> to give patients and consumers the ability to download their own information. And with actually no marketing, uh, over actually now approaching 350,000 unique users have downloaded a copy of their own data on average three times each. And the stories that we're getting from veterans, from soldiers, from Medicare beneficiaries about how they're using the data and how it's benefiting them are really, really moving. And shows that even basic data liquidity at a fundamental level really does help move the ball forward on improving health and healthcare. Uh, information liberation part two is increasing market transparency. So another set of provisions in the Affordable Care Act bring a lot of new transparency to the healthcare marketplace. So for example, we launched a site last year called healthcare.gov. That's the first website to compile a comprehensive inventory of insurance options by zip code across the country, benefits and pricing, which we added uh, October of last year. And significantly enhanced clinical provider quality info is also on the way. Which leads me to part three of information liberation, which is something called the Health Data Initiative. Have you all heard about the Health Data Initiative? Who, who here actually hasn't heard about it? Which is useful for me to understand. Oh, so actually you all have heard about it? No, okay, okay, <laughs> okay. let me just actually talk through it uh, quickly. So the Health Data Initiative is a uh, campaign that HHS and our sister agencies like USDA and EPA have been engaged in to essentially turn HHS into the NOAA of health data. Do you all know no what NOAA is? I actually didn't know what NOAA was before I joined the federal government about two years ago, but NOAA is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and it collects, it turns out, virtually all weather data in the United States, and then chooses to do something very interesting with the weather data. It publishes this weather data online in machine-readable format for anyone to pick up for free. Then a whole bunch of innovators in the private sector take that weather data and turn it into Weather Channel, Weather.com, iPhone, weather apps, weather insurance, weather research, et cetera, which is a fantastic example of how a uh, public-private ecosystem can work together to create a lot of value with the public sector supplying data and the private sector supplying the innovation mojo that turns it into value for the American people. The government ran a similar plan in the 1980s with GPS data uh, when the government famously published GPS data as an open resource, which then now fuels everything from oil tanker navigation systems to your cell phone, to your car's navigation system, uh, and everything in between. So uh, the Health Data Initiative is just the latest attempt by the government to run this play, open up its data and fuel innovation with that data play with the specific objective of stimulating a rising tide of innovation that improves health and healthcare through the power of data. So the core activities in the Health Data Initiative are actually quite, quite straightforward. One, we're publishing brand new data, never before seen by the public for public access, rigorously protecting privacy and confidentiality. So we're publishing no data 
that violates privacy or confidentiality, trade secrets, uh, laws, and regulations, of course. Um, secondly, we're making existing HHS data much more accessible. Just because data happens to sit in a book or on a website doesn't mean it's actually usable by developers. So we're making it machine readable, downloadable, accessible via application programming interfaces, making it free wherever we can, making it much easier to find. And then finally, because it actually turns out that a whole bunch of innovators have no idea we even have this data, let alone the fact that we're making it available, we are actually marketing the heck out of it to innovators across the country, marketing our free data to folks so they can know that it exists and connect to it and turn it into applications and services that help improve health and healthcare. So what kinds of data are we liberating, you might ask? Well, just to walk through this quickly, uh, it's impossible to talk through all of it, uh, but to give you a sense of the gestalt of what we're talking about, uh, we published over 1,100 metrics of community health and healthcare performance at a site called healthindicators.gov, where all the data is downloadable, accessible via API, everything from smoking rates and obesity rates by region across the country to utilization of Medicare services, uh, hospital admissions and readmissions by condition, uh, uh, determinants of health and healthcare performance like access to healthy food, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, we are taking all of our provider quality data and we've, we're putting APIs on it. We put APIs on it uh, September of last year to make it super easy to take our hospital quality data or nursing home quality data and actually parse it and ingest it in other applications that can make use of it. We're publishing nationwide directories of elder care support services, mental health services, substance abuse centers, FQHCs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, under a very important provision of the Affordable Care Act, Section 10332. Uh, coming January of 2012, we are making the Medicare claims files available for the first time at cost to any private or public entity that can mash it up with other payer data for the purposes of provider quality measurement. So that's very, very exciting. Um, blue button we just talked about. We are uh, continually enhancing this information with more and more richer data. So for example, the CMS blue button data, we're adding, we just added diagnosis code to the claims data that you can download uh, for yourself in June, we're adding procedure code data uh, to the claim detail information in September. And uh, VA and DOD are, are, are continually adding more info to their blue button data as well to make it richer and richer. Uh, consumer product info, uh, we made FDA recall information for drugs, devices, and food downloadable in XML format October of last year. And there's a lot more where that came from. Uh, medical and scientific knowledge, uh, the National Library of Medicine has been doing open data since before it was cool to do open data, uh, but they keep raising their game and doing ever more spectacular things. So for example, they published an API portal uh, in September that gives you easy APIs to resources like clinicaltrials.gov that has every clinical trial uh, currently operational in America and many countries around the world. Medline Plus Connect is a fabulous new service. Y'all Are y'all familiar with Medline Plus, the site? So it's this tremendous site, right, which has enormous resources when it comes to uh, patient education uh, on health and medical topics. So Medline Plus Connect, what they did is they broke down all the content in Medline Plus, then mapped it to specific medication diagnosis codes, and they're doing the same with lab codes. And, and they've set it up as a service as of November of last year where any EHR or PHR can for free connect to Medline Plus Connect, say I've got a patient with this combination of medications and diagnoses, and Medline Plus Connect spits back a customized package of current updated Medline Plus content that specifically relates to those diagnoses and medications that you can surface in the workflow of your EHR and PHR so that your doc and so your patient has access to the best patient education info, uh, education info in real time right when they need it. And it's something that also, by the way, meets the meaningful use requirement around integration of patient education materials into the workflow. Uh, and so that's another fabulous example. Uh, we've made uh, Medicare claims files, uh, so so-called basic standalone files, available as the first ever uh, claim files available for public access for free. Now, because they're available for public access, they had to be massively redacted to ensure that you can't re-identify people with the data. But there's still a lot of useful information in that. And it's available now for all major types of care, nine categories of care, as of May of last year. So th this is, I mean, again, I can't possibly describe all the data we're liberating, but hopefully it gives you a sense of what we've got in our vaults at HHS and what we're making available as resources for innovators to turn into cool stuff. And we, uh, because it's hard to keep track of all that in your head, we put it all in one place, a site called healthdata.gov, which is a site we launched February of this year that's the new one-stop shop to get all of our free data. Uh, and we are updating this constantly with ever more data because HHS is just sitting on incredible stores of data that can produce a lot of value for the American people if put in the hands of innovators. And so on top of publishing the data, we're publicizing the data to innovators across the country, uh, and we're doing it in a way that's, that's relatively unconventional <laughs> by government standards, but seems to be working really well. 
So we've been issuing challenges and holding codathons with our partner Health 2.0. So a challenge is um, essentially a public competition to build the best app or the best service that leverages data to do something really cool. Um, I would highly recommend that to you as a way to get the best and brightest people interested in what you're doing. There's a site called health2challenge.org run by health2.0 where any organization, any of you, any government agency, any company, foundation can issue a challenge to build the best app that leverages this API or leverages that data to actually do something useful for people. Uh, something like 25 challenges have been issued thus far from a whole range of organizations. Uh, folks have also actually been convening codeathons. Do y'all know what a codeathon is? Uh, have you seen Social Network? Yeah, remember the scene where uh, Zuckerberg's in uh, a room with a whole bunch of students who are cheering, and these, the, these developers on computers who are coding and drinking, coding and drinking, coding. <laughs> That's a codeathon. Um, they're competing to be the next employee of Facebook. So we're doing the codeathons without the vodka, and we are actually getting a lot of great results still without the vodka. And what happens is, is that any organization, be it Georgetown University or Google, uh, essentially issues an open invite to, turns out, 100, 150, 200 people who show up and decide to get interested in health data and build apps and figure out what the best app is by the end of the day uh, through a friendly competition. Uh, this uh, particular picture is of a team called Team Maya from Pittsburgh that somehow heard about the Georgetown University Codathon got lab coats that matched with each other and had the little cool logos, rented a van, got up at Odark 100, drove to Georgetown on a cold February morning, God knows why, and got inspired. And in the course of eight hours, they actually had an idea and then coded a prototype of an idea called Food Oasis. So do you know what a food desert is? Have you heard about this concept of food deserts? So if you look at government data, one very disturbing phenomenon is huge swaths of America don't have access to healthy food, which then causes a lot of other problems, of course. So they came up with something called Food Oasis, which is essentially crowdsourcing the long tail of demand for healthy food in the food desert. It's kind of a mashup of text messaging group on farmer's markets. So what happens is through this app, through a text message, you can say, I'm interested in buying a zucchini. Or, and, and someone else says, I'm interested in buying five zucchini, 10 zucchini, 15 zucchini. It all goes to a website where food suppliers, co-ops, farmers, et cetera, can look at all the orders and then circle them and say, this collective set of orders for 200 zucchini, I will fill by showing up at St. John's Church this Saturday at 3 p.m. with zucchini for all of you. And I don't actually understand the food business, but apparently if you know demand in advance, and if all your inventory gets liquidated instantaneously, the cost of food drops like a rock, like to the point where food oasis can potentially deliver food at even lower cost than if Safeway existed in that food desert, which it does not. So they're now prototyping Food Oasis in two cities, New York City and Louisville, Kentucky. They're getting launched from other cities. They're getting interest from investors to fund it. And it all happened because five crazy dudes and dudettes showed up in Georgetown on a cold Saturday in February to come up with an idea that they coded in eight hours. And the thing that I get really excited about is less the idea of Food Oasis, which is really cool. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's very cool. But I'm even more excited about the fact that these five people are now addicted to making health and healthcare better. The only thing I learned about entrepreneurship in the private sector was that if you get the best people, you win. If you don't get the best people, you tend not to win, right? This is true of ecosystems as well. If we are successful and continue to attract the best and brightest innovators in America to help solve our healthcare problems, we will solve it. America will invent its way out of its healthcare problem. And so what's really exciting to me about these challenges and codathons is that they're attracting these incredibly talented people who haven't gotten the memo about what's impossible to attack problems in a whole new way, which is really, really wonderful. Um, we're also doing innovator meetups and conferences across the country. Um, if y'all actually want to talk about Health Data Initiative, talk about uh, how you can innovate with the data, how you can mash up our data with your data to actually create lots of value, I'll show up with bells on. Happy to talk anytime, anywhere with anyone about it. And we're also doing, we'll talk about in a second, annual health data pollutes. Uh, okay. And the goal of all this, if we could flip back to the, to the PowerPoint, is not to liberate particular data sets, not to even create a certain set of applications or products or services, but the goal is really to catalyze the emergence of a self-propelled, open, decentralized, vibrant, highly inventive ecosystem of innovation that's powered by the data and uses the data to improve health and healthcare and create jobs of the future at the same time. The diagram of the ecosystem is actually very simple. On the left, you have people like us and other sources supplying a whole bunch of open data for free in ways that innovators can use. And then on the, on the right, you have a rapidly growing array of innovators across the country that take that data and turn it into all kinds of features, capabilities, products, and services, 
like innovators have done in the past with GPS data or weather data, to improve health and healthcare, to help consumers find the right resources, get the right information, to help employers promote health and wellness, to help care providers deliver better care, to help journalists break better stories, to help shed light on key disparities or other issues uh, that pressure communities into making, making something happen, uh, to help those local leaders make those better things happen with better informed decisions, to support all of the above through intermediary services that make it easier to build apps and services that do all of the above. And one thing I want to emphasize is that this is not something that's meant to, meant to be managed centrally by anybody. We've actually, at this point, completely lost control of this whole system, and we love that. <laughs> because there's no innovation ecosystem I can actually think of that's accomplished great things that's been centrally managed, right? We want 10,000 flowers to bloom. And a lot of them won't work. A lot of the flowers won't scale, but a bunch of them will. And those flowers will change the world. So we want this to be vibrant, self-propelled, decentralized, and a classically American attack on our problems through the power of ingenuity, creativity, and innovation. And this ecosystem is already taking off in a major, major way. Uh, and the best example of that, uh, which I'll just talk through quickly because we are running out of time, uh, we last, uh, not, not last, but just a, just a month ago, June 9th of 2011, uh, did our second annual Health Data Palooza, co-sponsored by the Institute of Medicine and HHS, uh, hosted by the Secretary. And what happened was we issued an open call, basically, uh, you know, now we're about 18 months into the Health Data Initiative, an open call to any company, inventor, nonprofit, for a service or product or application they had built, leveraging our data, in part or in whole, that helps consumers make better decisions, take control of their health care, helps doctors deliver better care, uh, helps health systems, employers, journalists, communities improve health and health care, because uh, we wanted them to actually give these TED-style 10-minute talks to showcase what they've done. We were overwhelmed by the number of people who wanted to talk, so we held a virtual American Idol-style bake-off, I'm not kidding, where everyone actually presented their 10-minute TED talk to a panel over a WebEx of judges. Uh, I was Paula Abdul. I loved everyone. I was crying all the time. Everything was so beautiful. Uh, but fortunately, we had some Simon Cowles who helped us winnow it down to 50 companies, 50 companies and nonprofits that actually exhibited that day and gave talks about what they've done, what they've already done. They didn't give PowerPoints about ideas about what they might do. They demoed actual working products, services, apps that leverage data to concretely help consumers, doctors, employers, communities improve care. And the other criterion we had, by the way, was that not only was it something that had to provide value, it had to have a sustainable business model. We were not interested in a concept car that would never be driven by anybody. We wanted to be able to actually be delivered to actual people and scale over time. And a side effect of that, by the way, is that if you have something that creates value for society and has a sustainable business model and is able to grow, that creates jobs of the future as well, uh, which is a welcome, welcome thing. Uh, there were also major announcements by nearly 20 additional companies and organizations about what they were going to do next. And I can't possibly go through all of these, but there are, there are a lot of examples of apps that help consumers, services that help consumers take control of their health and health care. Um, so uh, applications like iTriage that help you research medical treatments and find providers in your area that can help you. Um, Healthline, which integrates government data massively into uh, a search engine that powers Yahoo, AARP, Aetna, and other search uh, engines on the web uh, that makes health search a lot more useful by, 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 by essentially filtering out crap and making the information much more actionable uh, and valid uh, for a consumer using the internet to search for health information. Uh, patients Like Me, which is this phenomenal uh, site that allows patients to share information with people who have similar serious conditions like ALS, which built an integration with clinicaltrials.gov to create a feature called Trials for Me, where essentially patients like me will now, mining government data, tee up automatically clinical trials in your area that surface uh, that could help save your life you might be interested in. Um, Asmopolis, uh, which is this amazing, <laughs> amazing innovation, where an entrepreneur in Madison, Wisconsin, a veteran of the CDC, attached a GPS device to an asthma inhaler, integrated with a web app, so every time you use the uh, inhaler, it actually records when and where the attack happened. You share that information with your physician in two unscientific uh, trials uh, with groups of 40 patients each. It cut the rate of uncontrolled asthma from 75% to under 40%, which is pretty extraordinary. Uh, and uh, that's actually a difference of $3,000 per asthmatic per year if you move from uncontrolled to controlled. The North Carolina Health IT Beacon Committee is now rolling out a major, major new test of this, Food Oasis we talked about. Um, other examples of organizations that are actually taking uh, uh, government data and using it to arm new services 
that are, 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 are actually seeking to work for doctors and hospitals to help them become better medical homes, better ACOs, et cetera. So folks like Aetna and Essence that essentially have case management nurse services that they've now armed with government data and apps that they've built on government data and other data to help that nurse get a lot smarter about the community in which that person is living, uh, the 60-year-old depressed diabetic going to renal failure who's about to be discharged from the hospital and help connect that person to transportation resources, Meals on Wheels, the Best Dialysis Center, uh, nutritional counseling, et cetera. Um, I could go on and on and on. Uh, another set of examples, people helping communities improve health. Ozioma is this fantastic new service for journalists that got built by a team at the University of Washington, St. Louis that mines a whole bunch of government other data to essentially write 98% of local stories on health for you. Uh, by, uh, in a way that's just almost spooky. <laughs> but in an era where increasingly local papers, bloggers, and even major newspapers don't have their own research departments, don't have the bandwidth to really research health issues, it's essentially a virtual research department for journalists to help them identify and, and bring attention to key issues that, that otherwise wouldn't actually see the light of day, um, so on and so forth. Uh, lots of announcements, you know, uh, University of Michigan announcing that they're going to create the nation's first uh, graduate program focused on consumer health informatics. It's a joint venture of the School of Public Health School of Information. Actually, Chuck Friedman, who many of you know, has left ONC to go be the dean of that. So we're very sad and happy at the same time about that. Uh, Sanofi Aventis issuing a huge challenge, $210,000 uh, 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 a prize purse uh, to build apps that leverage the, uh, and services that leverage information that the government's published and others to help people manage diabetes. A uh, Walgreens CEO came by to say that uh, in key Walgreens hubs around the country, um, they're now going to be installing uh, more of these dudes in the red shirts at the Apple Genius Bar Star Trek desk, uh, which is essentially a, a health concierge, they call them a health guide, a free health concierge for any Walgreens customer to help connect them to resources in the community that could help them, uh, armed with government data. Uh, Startup Health, a new uh, seed accelerator, angel investor fund, entrepreneurship university to help manufacture more uh, health informatics entrepreneurs, health and wellness companies powered by data. And we also announced the launch of a new health data consortium, uh, ring led by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and consisting of a whole bunch of incredibly impressive organizations um, that is now going to take ownership of promotion of innovative use of health data going forward. They'll convene future data pollutes and uh, be hiring Johnny and Jane Appleseed evangelists of health data to walk the earth and connect people to the health data and brainstorm about innovative use and educate people about how to use the data so and so forth. So we're very, very excited about that. And at the end of the day, you know, I, I <laughs> I know there's been much gnashing of teeth, right, in the whole field of health IT and healthcare, right? You know, but I, frankly, have never been more optimistic than I am right now about the prospect of data and IT to change healthcare as we know it for the better. And it's not because I've been sitting in my office thinking happy thoughts to myself. <laughs> it's because I've spent literally much of the last year talking to literally hundreds of innovators across the country that are not just talking about change, they are the change. They are the change, and they're people from the largest institutions to juvenile delinquents in Silicon Valley and everyone in between, right, who've gotten addicted to this whole idea of changing healthcare, are leveraging this emerging change in incentives, are leveraging the new data being liberated by y'all and by the government and by everyone in between to drive real change, to build tangible things that already exist, that are getting traction, a lot of which won't work, but a lot of which will, which in, to, to me represent a mosaic of invention that will, in fact, reinvent healthcare from the inside out. There is no problem America has and America cannot invent its way out of. It's what makes us great as a country. And I have seen it in the work and in the labors of hundreds of innovators across the country. So at the end of the day, I've never been more optimistic about making this picture happen. Because I know that actually in the talk about boxes and data sets and direct protocols and blue button and connect this and connect that, it's often easy to lose sight of why we're doing all this but the reason we're doing all this is for this baby. Because the work that y'all are doing, the work that we're doing together, will save the life of a baby like this one. We'll save the lives of many babies, we'll make the lives of many families much better, and we'll help ensure the, the foundation of greatness for this country for a long time to come. What you're doing is as fundamental to the future of America and the future of this child as we're the work that anyone else is doing in America. And so what I would just ask you is that in the moments of discouragement you may have from time to time, in the moments of uncertainty you may have from time to time, just know this. This baby is counting on you. This baby is counting on all of us. And I've been never more optimistic than right now about our collective ability to help safeguard this baby's future. I have to stop now. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time and attention.
take a question? Could you take a question or two? Any questions? Questions? Oh, yes, sir. So as the, the CTO, technical conscience of HHS and all the funds are being directed to uh, health care, what is your position on the direct projects and the robust requirements required the IT innovation that you have in your slide? And your position on that qualifying for providers which is meaningfully used in the exchange function required for source two? Um, so, uh, so I'm a huge enthusiast about the direct project. Uh, I think it's a phenomenal uh, invention uh, by the country to, to help uh, solve a particular class of health exchange issues. It's not the universal panacea, nothing is, but I think it's a tremendous step forward. Um, and uh, you know, I, I very much hope that it's one that can meet as many of the requirements as possible, you know, particularly the ones that are around direct exchange, if that makes sense. So, you, uh, yeah. Uh, use yeah. 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 So um, I, I should probably uh, hold off on commenting directly on stage of meaningful use. Uh, you know, but that being said, um, uh, let me say that the rug project is something we're very enthused about, and to the extent there's a requirement for directed exchange. Right? Sending information from point A to point B, be it a lab result, a prescription, um, a care summary record, et cetera, including requirements in meaningful use and other settings. Direct was meant specifically to enable that. Okay. One more question. Yes, sir. So uh, it's, it's a phenomenal point, um, and uh, HHS is engaging in a whole bunch of work to uh, significantly improve the level of coordination between the different components of HHS. Uh, we don't necessarily think that we've uh, completely um, solved every single issue there, um, but uh, uh, there is a lot more coordination than has happened historically, um, and we put in place a series of mechanisms to amp up that level of coordination over time. Um, so I can tell you from the standpoint of the senior leadership team of HHS that we believe that everything that we're, we're working on is linked. Um, so health IT and health reform are inextricably interlinked. Payment reform, care delivery innovation, health IT, day liberation, they're all part of the same puzzle. Uh, and so we're really determined uh, to ensure that uh, to the greatest extent possible we can have all the dots connect um, and support coordinated action um, in the field uh, to, to take healthcare in the right direction. We're going to have to stop there, I think. Stop there? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I can stay for longer if you want. But yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, so, yes, ma'am. Um, so, uh, so one uh, uh, just, just general note is that um, I am not the resident HHS expert in uh, all the details <laughs> of privacy security confidentiality, so I lean heavily on Joy Pritz and others uh, to teach me um, and to, to guide us on this. Uh, but I think one general point that uh, you raised, which is a really good one, is that I think that um, a lot of the discussion around privacy and security um, is one that we need to do a better job of explaining to the public um, and explaining the stakes and explaining what we're trying to do. Um, as we um, seek to both maniacally protect privacy and confidentiality, and at the same time really un unlock the power of data exchange to, to help patients improve health. So, so I, I, I uh, uh, am uh, in incredibly supportive of what Joy and others are doing to push uh, the ball on that, um, and she is by far the best equipped <laughs> uh, 
to, uh, to address uh, uh, issues like the one you've raised. All right. We're going to have to end it there. Okay. Thanks Thank so you. much.